All right, we're going to start with the historical look at the cosmology of cultures and religion. Again, this had a rousing soundtrack, so I'll just have to talk through it. Um, I'm a uh, animator illustrator by trade, so. Wait a minute. And your animation did not play. Okay, here we go. If you guys have seen Flat Out Insights, this is what happens on every episode. So, yeah, this is doing this a live presentation. Yeah. yeah, not supposed to happen here. Okay. Oh, it has a lag to it. For some yeah, reason. there's a lag. I'm not sure. You got it. Okay, let me try. You got it. This is dual clicker thing. Hey, Liz, we may need you to, to punch that on there. You know what? You're just gonna forward it for us? Now we're gonna do this in 40 minutes. forward from there and you can use the there we go. keys. There's the lights. Stop with the um, Why is that not playing the animation? Can you go back? Hold on folks, just a second. You know what, just do the um, go out, exit, do the uh, escape and just show it that way. There you go, just show it from there. And then we can jump back in. Yeah, just show, just show the animation through there so Michael can start. There we go, and just go ahead and play that. And restart it. Okay guys, all right, take two, here we go. All right, historical look at the cosmology of cultures and religions. Uh, this animation shows the uh, different look of, of the, cos the cosmological ideas of various cultures. If you'll notice, they look very similar. And, and we're gonna look at the, uh, different, uh, the uh, different cultures as, as we move on, okay? So you're looking at the Babylonian, the Hebrew, Norse, uh, uh, Taiwan, and not only that, their cosmology governed the map, all right? Each one had their own version of the map, but if you look at that, the map all looks similar. Very interesting. These weren't a unified people, okay? So let's move on to the next slide. Okay, one of the best ways to explore an ancient culture is to observe their art artistic expression. Any good archaeologist knows this because they didn't have print or magazines or anything like that, so they recorded who they are and what they believe through their art. Next. All right, so we have here the Babylonian cosmology, and I'm coming to a point here. So pay cl close attention to how they illustrated their world. Next. Then we have the Celtic Irish cosmology. Look at this, it's fascinating. Next. Hindu. Norse, with Thor and all this stuff, and, and they actually called their dome the Bifrost. Next. Uh, and then you have the Hebrew cosmology. Now, separated by culture, vast distances, and time, all right, separated by all of these walls, yet they all had the identical cosmology. Now, what I love about this is modern science says, oh, well, they were just ignorant people, all right? They didn't know anything, okay? Yet, they all had the same cosmology. And some people would say, well, they travel across the world and proselytize. Have you ever heard of a Viking proselytizing? Okay, when they landed on your shores, they weren't saying, please believe in Thor. No, all right, they're gonna get you. So, 
So look at all the distances and the cultural distances, all right? But they had all the same, same cosmology. Next. So see if you can go back to the uh, regular PowerPoint for it. That's a slide 11. So we'll see if we can get there. Because that will not work the way we just did that. Oh, you figured it out. Nice. Maybe Liz should be up here speaking. <laughs> yeah. So Michael, what Michael had just showed is that the whole entire world believed in a cosmology that was not a sphere Earth. It was not a heliocentric model, right? It was a, everything was enclosed cosmology. Everything was based upon a flat Earth with a dome over it. It was, everybody knew this, right? So when did things start to change? And that's where it begins to get very interesting. Uh, you start to see the 6th century a, uh, BC. You start to see uh, this is when Pythagoras jumps onto the scene and he starts supporting the idea of a sphere Earth. Like I said, we're going to be going through much, much more detail in this. 5th century, every century, a new layer, a new avenue started to build upon the idea. And it started with the early Greeks and the Romans. Um, you start to see this, and it was all based upon a very simple premise that we're going to show you why the deception is so heavy. Uh, Aristotle, 4th century, very famous, obviously, right? This is when he was believing that the earth was not even of great size. So this is the foundations of the early forms of the heliocentric model. Then you've got 3rd uh, century, uh, the earth is a sphere, even with all the flat level water, right? And even ideas starting to form from there. Then you have the occultus Aristophanes, right? This is a big famous one. This is the one that we all get, right? Everywhere we go, everybody's talking about obelisks. Who here knows what an obelisk is? Everybody, right? I'm just speaking That's to the disgusting. clay. Right? So an obelisk, right? But if you know what an obelisk really is, it is the occult symbol of their god, their phallic symbol of Nimrod. And what did they do? Well, the shadows of it dictate it. The circumference of the earth, I, I believe it was around 28,000 he came up with, and yet we now know it's about 24,900, correct, right? So by, by the time we continue to move on, it, it just keeps growing and growing every, every year, a new layer, a new layer, something to break down this model of what everybody in the world always believed. By the time you get to the second century, you just start to see it just continue to build every thousand, every hundred, every couple, you know, thousand years, hundred years, it's always changing. By the time we get to Strabo, this is where we start to see the biggest thing that is the proof. Now we're actually starting to get proofs as this history of this timeline goes on. Ships over the horizon, you know, as they, this one is still used to this day, Strabo, you know, next one will be Platolome, and, um, you know, all this is about, you know, map making. This is about, you know, the early forms of ships over the horizon. Um, all the things that are still used today that are not provable. Can you see at the beginning of the preconditioning? And it's, it's horrible, but extremely well designed. And it all started back then. Yeah, and, and there's a reason, there's a method. In the, and, uh, and we're going to talk about what we believe is taking place here. Now we're moving into... AD. So after the time of Christ, we start to see even now the church fathers are starting to just briefly adapt this version, which has not even been fully adaptable yet based upon early church. Um, we flash forward to the 5th and 7th centuries. It's being more elevated into the church, and it's being brought out much, much more. By the time, you know, which is interesting, uh, discovering Islamic cosmology, we all would say from the Quran, it's a flat earth book, but their origins are based on Hellenistic astronomy, which is globe based, which is very interesting and has a very important part in history and which we can only touch a little bit on all this stuff. You got, of course, Magellan. He didn't prove that the earth was a globe, but he circumnavigated it, right? This is their proof. So they've got ships over the horizon, now they've got circumnavigation. It's becoming a closed case. So by the time you get to the 16th century, the, th the third model of Copernicus' revolution of his model on his deathbed, he revealed 
the full plan that we have today, which has been taking place all the way back, as we can see, from the early as the 6th century. By the 16th century, we've got the full church fully now, uh, not only rejecting initially, but fully adopting it. And, and Liz is doing a pretty good job of, of mm -hmm. getting the first. So by the 17th, 18th century, it's in our school systems by the Jesuits. Jesuits put these into the school systems, start pumping out these things. You're an idiot, you're a moron, if you even just considered it even back then. We're going to go much deeper a little bit here in a second. But as you see, by the time you get to the 19th century, there was only a small amount of Bible-believing Christians who they feared would protest this are even still remaining to be flat, geocentric. And then, of course, we get to today. U.S. government, right, they ended the debate. And they put a man on the moon, they showed us pictures. Okay, guys, we can all go home now. So it's all <laughs> right. over, it's all done. That's right. So, you know, that, that, that little short line is uh, extremely short. But one thing that most people do not talk about is the Zohar. Who here knows what the Zohar is? Okay, so the Zohar is Jewish mysticism, it's Kabbalah, it is pretty Magic. much every aspect and realm, what is behind everything there. It is a satanic agenda. They were pumping out in the Zohar 1,500 years before the Copernican Revolution, so you can predate that in the timeline, which it's not in there. They were writing specifically about how the Earth spun on its own axis and that the Earth was a globe. Have you seen the scientists nowadays, and, and you've seen those videos where they go in the video and they say, the Zohar had, had modern heliocentrism all those years back. How did they do that? And they had no modern science. It's the occult thing that's just infiltrated science. Yeah. That's all it was. So I'm going to tell you guys one thing. So we come from a biblical background. So if you guys are in here, unfortunately, you're going to get a lot of Bible coming up. So all right. Gonna get that out of the way. So Nathan Thompson's in the other room talking about not eating meat. So you, or you can stay here about five. <laughs> so it's your choice. Um, God creates. Satan steals. He can't create. He has to manipulate everything. He steals all these good things. There, everything that you see that is satanically out there, he has stolen. There is an aspect of layer of truth to what he does. And he has to, and then he actually takes everything that he does and flips it and does a, a complete reversal. So as we move on to this next slide, let me see if these things are, uh, this is the Kabbalah, okay? So if you guys have heard of the Kabbalah, that is exactly what the Zohar is. And so we don't have time to go exactly into every detail of Kabbalah, but this is that satanic agenda that started way long ago before that timeline happened which is still the root it cost. So every time you see occult symbolism in NASA, it is a prelude to what their gods and what their deities are, which is centered around Kabbalah, m Jewish mysticism, and a very satanic organization. So whatever we're talking about, Freemasonry, wh whether, whatever realm we're talking about is all centered around this. And that's what they show us. And that's what is truth. All right, so the struggle for truth continues. So with, with that background knowledge, how did we end up where we are today as far as um, large amounts of people actually fighting the heliocentric model? So what you see here are all the books, not all the books, but, but, but many books of flat earthers written back in the 1800s. And these guys were prolific. Okay, and they wrote all kinds of books talking about the flat earth and contradicting heliocentrism. Let's be clear on something. This is not a resurgence. The movement that's existing now, and yes, I dare call it a movement because back in uh, before 2015, if you uh, Googled flat earth, you would get about 50 hits. But, but by the time, what, two years later, 12 million, okay, I, and then it ended up 23 million before um, uh, YouTube slammed us down. So 
this is not a resurgence. This is a continuance. We're simply continuing what these guys did, what, what they um, tried, tried to do in the 1800s. All right, so what I did was I went to, to the Library of Congress and I did a very short, go ahead, I did a very short uh, search, a simple search from uh, 18, and my results yielded from 1848 to 1996. These are some of the titles. William Carpenter, 100 Proofs That the Earth is Not a Globe, 1885. Walter Davenport, They Called Me Flathead. Yes, they were doing that in 1927. All right, and this guy was a newspaper. Um, he he uh, had a newspaper stand, all right, and he was talking about flat earth at a newspaper stand. Next. Okay, Charles E. Defford, A Reparation, Universal Gravitation, A Universal Fake, 1992. Alex Gleason, most of you know him, who, who created the map, okay, that, that, that we all use. Uh, well, most of us, anyway. Uh, is, is the Bible from heaven, is the earth a globe? 1893. Henry A. Gowdy, earth not a globe, scientifically, geometrically, philosophically demonstrated. Over 75 arguments and 30 diagrams, 1930. This book is huge, okay? And you can get all these books for free, by the way. Carl Albert Smith, is the earth a whirling globe? I love that one. 1901. And terra firma, the earth not a planet, proved from scripture, reason, and fact, 1901. Go ahead. The movement to reveal true cosmology did not start in 2015. I love it when they say that. Oh, how did all this silliness start? This stuff was going on long before any of us were born. All right? So when they tell you that, that's just foolishness. Okay, so before I go into uh, this, um, I'm going to share a little bit about my background and uh, where, we, where I came from. Um, I was actually taught the geocentric model of, of Earth uh, in my high school. So the high school that I was privileged to go to in the 1990s, um, I was under a science teacher who taught the geocentric model of Earth. He did not teach flat Earth, but he did let us know you, we are the center of the universe, and we do not move. I learned that simple principle from scripture as well as science. And he taught us in that science textbook that he created, the very first thing is how they manipulate us. And it's with media, it's with TV, newspapers, movies, and right there in the beginning of your science curriculum, that's how your curriculum starts. I think if we started our science curriculums with that today, we'd be somewhere uh, in science. So, I, I want to chime in, just, yeah. just a second. When I first learned the Earth was flat, I told my wife, I said, the Earth doesn't move. And she said, well, yeah, no, 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 of course not. I said, what are you talking about? Oh, I was taught that in high school. What? She never told me, okay, until I came to tell her the Earth was flat. So my wife, who's sitting back there, actually learned the same thing in school, yeah. where I was thought, taught the whole heliocentric thing. And so me and my wife, and uh, there's another person here uh, that went to our same high school as well. Um, the flat geocentric model was the dominant view. Obviously, we went through some of these things. Um, and uh, what this actually caused and did was caused Bible believers to read the Bible instead of literally had to become new figuratively. As we adopted this heliocentric model, we changed how we actually read Scripture as Bible believers for many years. Um, the majority of Protestants still held on to this geocentric view, even when the flat earth model was becoming obsolete. And I'm going to show you that. And that is so important to where we're at today. Most people, you know, we just look at geocentric and say they just believe half of the truth, right? But they are very important to where we're at today. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, obviously, they didn't, in the Catholic Church, uh, I talked a little bit about that. That was 1632. So if we go back to our timeline, when they started to fully embrace all these things, um, the next rise of geocentrism and flat earth, Michael covered that um, in those 18 periodicals. What Michael did not cover is what was taking place. And that was all the experiments. All the experiments by who? 
by the heliocentrists, by the people who believed in the sphere. And they failed every single one of them. These are the most prestigious ones. We've got Aries failure. It's not called Aries success. It's Aries failure. Starlight moves. Uh, the telescope remains stationary. We got the Michelson-Morley experiment. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, no rotation of Earth. We got the Michelson-Gale experiment. And if you guys are going to want to learn much more about these, you go to Bob Modell's talks um, and the famous gyroscope Netflix stuff. And he's got some amazing things that he'll, uh, he'll talk about about that. Then we've got the Sagnet experiment. None of these proved the rotation of Earth. None of them. These were the same experiments I was learning about in high school that were failing. And they did fail. We've got the, the Bedford level was more of a curvature test. And that also failed by Robotham as well. But what happened? What, what, what occurred? Well, the debunking began. And uh, obviously, we all know this as the realm of the theory of relativity. Just like the theory of gravity, the Big Bang theory. Yes, again, we have a theory, a thought, a idea based upon math, which can be proven if the hypothesis is your starting point that's in your brain. Chew on that for a while. This theory was determined that the laws of physics are the same for all non-accelerating observers, and he showed that the speed of light within a vacuum is the same no matter the speed at which an observer travels. This is how he proved all the things that Michelson, Morley, Gale did. We can't reveal that, so we're not going to talk about it. Here's how we are going to just silence all of those tests. However, all the previous experiments proved otherwise, just like the theory of evolution this one has become our dominant view still in our textbooks and all of our students, all of our kids learn the theory of relativity and they actually don't even know why it was truly put out there. Einstein even said that the, it, it, based upon the Michelson-Gale experiment, he said it was quite an embarrassment to the scientific community. And he even said out of his mouth that no experiment could prove the spin of the earth, only his theory. So now we get to my favorite part, which is the resurgence of modern geocentrism. 1967, Walter Van de Kamp, he was a Canadian man. He traveled down to the Ohio area, which I'm going to say is very important, because me and Michael happen to be both from Ohio. So keep that in mind. And it's going to come into play extremely important here. He published a paper called Heart of the Matter. And in the heart of the matter, he presented the geocentric model of Earth, and he presented it to prestigious men, which was very important. He formed the Tyconian Society. That Tyconian Society put out a bulletin. That bulletin is known as the Bulletin of the Tyconian Society. It was a publication just like the Earth is not a globe that was presented in the 1800s. This one was going around teaching the truths of geocentricity all throughout the world, and they were pumping that out. 1984, Van de Kamp retired, and this is where it gets really interesting. Gerardus Bio, he was a professor of Case Western Reserve, later uh, Baldwin Wallace University. Those are two prestigious schools in Ohio. He was the head of astronomy. And while, while a head of astronomy was pumping out the world's most sophisticated defense of geocentric all throughout 1984 till about 2014 when he finally truly just ended up retiring. Um, but that was called the Biblical Astronomer. You can go to their website. It's called geocentricity.org. Uh, and you can go there and find over 2 million PDFs they have defending that the Earth does not move based upon science. Every single one of the men that worked with Gerardus happened to be all prestigious men of colleges. Um, you know, so all of us may be, hey, we're novice. You know, we study these things. We repeat these things. These are the guys that ran heads of astronomy programs. And they were, they were saying half of what we're saying. And they were very good at it. So you can see they have a lot of books that you can go check out. Other geocentrists include uh, even some of the people that were here last year debating. Rob Skeeve on stage was Dr. Sungenis. Um, so this is what I call the Cleveland connection of the geocentric. If you guys didn't know, the Mickelson-Morley experiment happened at Case Western Reserve, what is now known as Case Western Reserve. 
We had professors, James Hansen, he was of Cleveland State. We had Gerard Espio, who was Case Western and Baldwin-Wallace. Then we had the publication, The Biblical Astronomer, produced right there in Cleveland, going all around the world, uh, that, and that was doing that. You've got our high school, Heritage Christian School, so if you're watching me, there it is. And uh, that was absolutely amazing. And then, of course, you've got now me and Michael and Take on the World Conference. So for all of you who can't take on the World Conference, you can give a shout out to that. So there you go. There you go. So Cleveland is what I call the mecca for modern geocentricity. And it was so important to get to where we're at today. And, and the reason why is, you know, when, they, when you go back to the, the Galileo, who, who's seen the, uh, the Galileo uh, space probe that was pointed at the Earth about three million miles away? Who, who's seen that? Everybody should in here see. If you're flat Earth, you should have seen that, right? And that shows the Earth spinning and rotating. But the, what is the one problem with that video? Is the clouds never move over a 24-hour time lapse, right? Okay. Now, what does the geocentric person say when they see that? Well, go back to my notes. In high school, how do they manipulate us? With TV, with movies, with video, right? They would say that is a lie. But when they see a picture of the Earth, hmm, what do they say? Well, here's my challenge. If there's any geocentric people watching this, if you're here today or you're watching this on a live, let's go through some challenges there. If you're a Bible believer, this is absolutely crucial. The fundamental aspect of the heliocentric model, which is so foundational, is that the sun comes before the earth. And if that foundation is off, the whole thing is off, okay? First line of the Bible. If you guys believe the Bible, it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. What came first? The earth, right? The earth came first. Yeah, the heaven, yeah, heavens and earth. But what came first, heaven or the, uh, or the sun or the earth, right? We know the Bible teaches that the earth came first. Those two things are at odds and at war at each other already. On day four, he created the sun. If you reject, uh, if you hold to a heliocentric model as a believer, your stance already rejects the opening line of the Bible. That's my challenge to all the geocentric people who are still clinging and holding on to this while adapting aspects and parts of heliocentricity. Your model is already basic and it's already off. If that line is off, how much of the whole entire book is off? We might as well just throw it out. We just might as well throw out the Bible. If Can I say a quote? Yeah. Um, the Bible and heliocentrism are unreconcilable, unquote. You know who said that? Neil deGrasse Tyson. Okay, he actually admitted that because they're so contradictory, they cannot meet up. So if Genesis 1-1 is off, so is John 1-1. If you guys don't know what John 1-1 says, it says that in the beginning was the word, and that word in Greek is the logos. The logos is Jesus. It says in the beginning was the word, and that is Jesus Christ. And it says, and the word was with God and the word was God. This is a prelude to creation right here in the book of John. And so when you take Genesis 1-1 off, you might as well throw away John 1-1. And so many people in that, whether it be a creation ministry, any of those creation ministries who believe in John 1-1, they actually don't even believe Genesis 1-1 because they automatically throw it off with their belief in the heliocentric model. If your model puts the sun first, then by default it rejects the sun that brings salvation. And that is absolutely true. If you believe, if you believe that the earth is young and came before the sun while the holding on to the rest of heliocentric model, you neither have a biblical model nor a scientific model. You have your own version that can't be supported by either one. You have your own little mesh up in your head, which, I'm sorry to say it, answers in Genesis, creation, you know, every creation ministries, you know, this is your stance. You have your own version, you have, and that is, that can't be supported by either one. Okay, so 
With that in mind, what brings us here today? What brings us here and here, okay? With all these guys talking about the flat earth, simple. Go to the next, yeah, okay. We finally realized they're all lies, fantasy, deception, fill in the blank, okay? So we all finally realized that. And the second point is then we learn how to discover and share the truth on our own, all right? So we stop just listening to the scientific world and just taking the word for it. We learn how to figure this out ourselves without a degree. And don't get me wrong, I don't have a problem with, with going to university and studying and stuff like that. I don't have a problem with that, unless it's astrophysics, because that's just like learning Klingon, okay? <laughs> astrophysics is not a science at all, all right? But, um, I don't have anything against that, but you don't need it in order to realize where you live, to realize what creation is. All right, so three points. We can actually learn where we live through photography, simple forest, uh, forensic editing, and eyes open common sense. All right, so let's look at the first one. I'm just gonna go through three proofs that, that I shot myself, all right? So we have here ye old boat on the horizon, okay? So this is a real, real common proof here. You can play that. So I started out at 2,000 millimeter with the official flat earth camera, all right? And Nikon actually knows that. That's why they came out with an upgrade, all right? So the official uh, uh, P900, I started out with 2,000 millimeter. I stopped at 50. Um, this, I'm trying not to make this a photography lesson, but when you do this test, don't stop at 24 millimeter because that's not what your eye sees, okay? Stop at 50 so you won't get your dissenter saying, oh, you didn't do that experiment right, all right? So you can start at 2,000 or with the P1000, P you can start at 3,000, but you stop at 50 because that's equivalent to the proportions that your eye sees, all right? Yet you see nothing, okay? The boat is not... You, you can't see it, but I can zoom in on it. What does that mean? No curve. Then that leaves you on a logical domino effect of conclusions. So, but we have to be willing to embrace those conclusions. Next. All right, now we have this image, this video from the Hubble telescope. They put some of these labels on here to show the constellations and all that stuff. Uh, and they're all pagan names, isn't that interesting? Um, so then, the Hubble telescope zoomed in, I got this straight from the NASA website, zoomed in on these constellations trillions and trillions of miles away. First of all, I didn't know the Hubble telescope was a zoom lens, all right? So then we're zooming in, but then what I did, okay, it stops here, and then we go on to the, no, don't, don't, it's gonna continue. All right, so then I simply increased the, the contrast a little bit, okay? and. This is the forensic part. So I increase the contrast a little bit. As you can see, as it's zooming into this constellation, you see those lines around it? Okay, so they're basically taking stills. Look at those borders. They're basically taking stills and simply enlarging them to make it look, look like, look, look at that. Okay, to, to make it look like they're zooming in on all these constellations that you can literally see back in time. That's what they say. We can see. Can anybody read my tag back there? Can anyone read my tag back there? No, I mean the little letters. Can you read that? Shame on you, because you can actually see constellations, trillions of light years, not miles, light years. If you can do that, you should be able to read this. But you can, okay? It's downright foolishness, all right? So next. Okay, so fake video, all right? That's really the conclusion there, it, it's not real. So that leads you on a domino effect of conclusions that you have to embrace. Next. All right, so this was shot at the last take on the world. These are called crepuscular rays, one of my favorite evidences of a close sun. So you have here um, sunbeams, that's called crepuscular rays, coming through the clouds. Now according to science, the reason why you see this is because it's perspective, all right? because you see how, um, you can play that, you, you, you see how you see the um, railroad tracks converging into the distance, right? We've all seen that. 
And as you move and you are no longer lined up with the tracks, you cease to see that, that, that convergence, okay? That's called one, a single point perspective, okay? Next. All right, now, what makes crepuscular rays? Next. You have three parts, obstruction, proximity, and particulates. The, the uh, obstruction are the clouds, the proximity of the sun to the clouds, and then particulates, which is dust in the air, fog, mist, that sort of thing. So basically, the only way you can get crepuscular rays uh, with clouds, you can get it in the theater. Um, I've set up lights where I have to actually create these. The light source has to be close to the obstruction. It has to be very close, okay? Or you're not gonna get the light beam spreading out like that. So what does that mean? Perspective is not involved at all, all right? That means you have to have a close light source, a lot closer than 93 million miles away, a lot closer. So that means the sun is actually within the, forgive me, I don't have another word, atmosphere, okay? The sun is within the clouds. It is not 93 million miles away. That leads you on a serious domino effect. Guess what? If, if this is actually true, solar system doesn't exist. Kills it. No solar system. If there's no solar system, there's no space, okay? So it's a real easy conclusion to make if you're willing to make it. Next. Okay, so now we've, we've reached the point in the ending of this presentation. So we're gonna quickly wrap this up because um, it looks like we're, we're getting out of time here. Um, if we take it back to the beginning, I said that, remember, Satan doesn't create. He just manipulates what is already existing. So what is the true purpose? Everybody talks about when we come into flat earth, we talk about they're hiding God. Right, that's the most common thing we always hear, hiding God or they're hiding more land, hiding more resources. There's a, there's, there's a spiritual component, there's a physical component, worldly component. Let's talk a little bit about that. The key to understanding in close cosmology, I believe, lies within the beginning of creation, within creation itself, when the world was actually created. That is a passage in Genesis and it's Genesis 1.14, and it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament. What are those lights? It is the sun, the moon, and the stars. They're inside of the firmament, not outside of them. It says, In the firmament. They move. The Bible tells us those things are the things moving. Those are the things that are detecting. The Michelson-Gale experiment actually didn't prove that... Um, the earth moved. It actually proved the celestial bodies moved. Bob Nodell actually proved that the celestial bodies move. He didn't prove that the, the gyroscope fail experiment proved that the earth spun. And, right? So, I mean, come on. Ridiculous. Um, it says they were there to create or to divide the day from night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Guys, that word for mo uh, the word for season here doesn't necessarily mean summer, winter, spring, and fall. That word for seasons reads moed, the moedim, and it says it is for the appointed times, the appointed feast, meeting times that the creator of this cosmos has for you. What are they? One of them is Passover where Jesus shed his blood for you. Unleavened bread, where Jesus was buried for three days and for three nights. The Feast of Weeks, which includes first fruits and Shavuot, where Jesus is resurrected, he ascends, and sends his Holy Spirit. Why is this important? Hold on. Yeah, I should do the clicker. Let's see if that works. No, it doesn't work. Okay. Because um, that would be better. Uh, why is this so important? Because guess what science tells us? Science says that we are in this heliocentric model where we have new constellations coming in all the time. Which we've never seen them. Yet we are getting closer to suns, new things are gonna appear, new, all these things are gonna be happening. 
All these things are being developed, changing our cosmology, changing his cosmology from the beginning, which has a purpose and a plan. Throughout history, Passover, Unleavened Bread, for, uh, Feast of Weeks have been proven by the sun, moon, and the stars and the rotations on point every time, every year, all the time, always. Perfect. Now, there's calendar debates, but hey, they always fall perfectly in time all the time throughout that model. They're not just hiding God. There's something else that they're hiding. It's much more. Because the fall feast reveals something much different. They are the day of trumpets, the final return of Jesus. The day of atonement where Jesus eliminates sin by Satan for a thousand years. You have Sukkot where Jesus dwells with man for a thousand years. And you have the eighth day where a new heavens and a new earth begin, the final resting point. This is the, this is the purpose of the Moedim that were created in creation based upon the sun, moon, and the stars and their movement. Everything that can be proved that we see in our life has been shown. This is it. They are the redemption of your soul. So every time you look up those and you actually believe in the Bible, you can look up those and actually rejoice in your salvations because they've been created for that and what is known as our blessed hope, which is his return. They're not just hiding God. They're hiding that there is a God coming back for you. You know, um, I challenge you, this is our challenge today, is if you do not know him, the point of this uh, conference this year on top, it was finding the creator in creation. Now, I know a lot of people have different thoughts, different opinions. We happen to believe that the one that lines up perfectly to these Moedim based upon the sun, moon, and the stars happens to be him, and his name is Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. And if you do not know him, today is your day of salvation. Come meet with one of us, Nathan Reynolds, any of those of us that, um, you know, uh, you know, are out there and you want to pull aside, just come see one of us. And uh, we will be doing a full two to three hour presentation where we'll go much deeper into so many other things right. on that presentation. So I don't know if you have anything that you want to share. One thing I would like to say, we're not talking religion here. We're not talking about go to church and clap and, and say, hey, pastor. Okay. We're not talking about that. We're talking about an actual relationship with the individual, with the individual that created all of this a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship where you talk to him and yes he does talk to you that's what we're talking that's what we're discussing here forget religion we're talking about a relationship with the creator himself where he involves himself in his life and he wants to use and share that power that he has with you that's what we're talking about here thank you so much thank you